Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful today as we approach your word, God, that you would open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we'll give our interest and our attention, God. Lord, we know that you'll do your part, revealing your truth and your heart to us, God. Lord, we welcome your Holy Spirit today. Holy Spirit, be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, even the direction and the correction we need, Lord. We'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel. We bless them as you would bless us this day. God, bless all of our brothers and sisters, denominational, non-denominational, large and small. God, doesn't matter to us, Lord, if they're preaching your truth, preaching your gospel, lifting up the name of Jesus, Lord, we bless them. God, also, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. Lord, protect them, bless them, be with them. May they endure to the end. And Father, we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. Amen. Today, get your Bibles out, and I want you to go with me to two sections of Scripture, okay? I'm going to go to two sections of Scripture. I want you to start at Luke chapter 6. Verse number 37, Luke chapter 6, verse number 37, put a ribbon or put a pencil or a, or a thumb or maybe a foot or something like that in there. Just, just get Luke chapter 6, verse 37 tagged in your Bible, okay? And then I want you to head over to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start at Matthew chapter 7, okay? So start at Luke 6, 37, put, put some sort of a marker there, and then head back to Matthew chapter number 7. Now, I want to review because we're starting this series called The Blessed Life. This is part number one of The Blessed Life. Like I mentioned, we're going to be going through this for a number of weeks. The reason why we're doing this is because we are headed into our third year of the Capital Stewardship Campaign called Freedom for Our Future. You notice the big square buttons on both sides of the sanctuary. It says Freedom for Our Future. There were four freedoms. If I can refresh your thinking, remind you of those things, or maybe for those of you that are just joining us that are new, uh, you can catch up right where we're at. We started the process of the Capital Stewardship Campaign. You say, what is that? It is a money management campaign. And what we're doing as a church is we're gathering together and we are paying off the mortgage of this building. Our goal is in three years, okay, now remember we're headed into our third year, but in three years we wanted to pay off the mortgage amount on this building, $13 million. We have already $9 million in pledges. We've received from you guys $3 million over the past two years. And with the wise financial stewardship of the church, we've been able to pay down another million for a total of $4 million. That's phenomenal and that, that deserves a shout to the Lord. It's exciting. And the reason why we embarked on this mission is for a couple of reasons. Number one, we needed freedom for the next generation. We didn't want to be bound. We didn't want to leave a burden of debt to the next generation. And and we're not just talking about myself, Pastor Luke, Pastor Jess, the generation that's coming up under Pastor Jim and Deborah. No, we're talking about your children and your children's children, that they would stand in the pulpits of this place and declare the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this cannot be a one-generation church. Church experts have studied and said that the shelf life of a church is roughly 25 years. Now, we're coming up on our 27th year in June here. And we're not on a downward spiral in this church. No, we're just getting started. We are on an upward swing of growth. We're moving on. We're moving forward. We're building for the next generation. And we're going to reach the generations till Jesus comes. That's what this is all about. Secondly, you remember this, that we needed freedom from financial institutions. See, the Bible tells us that the borrower is slave to the lender. We didn't want to be in that position. We wanted to be free to do what we needed to do. Didn't want somebody coming in and saying, hey, we have to call the note. You guys need to go meet in the park or something else or go find another rented facility because now we're foreclosing on your building and then they sell it to some ungodly organization that comes and gathers, not in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, not on my watch, not on this church's watch. That's not gonna happen in this place. We will not allow some ungodly organization to take what the Lord has claimed in this valley, in the Inland Empire. So we said we won't be bound, but can I bring a new thought to you today? There's more than just mortgage companies that are financial institutions. What about the gas company? What about the energy companies? See, we're starting to take a look at this in a whole new light, and we're taking a look at ways and measures that we can do, you know, things like, you know, maybe you didn't know that we were on well water here at The Rock. What if our well breaks down? You know that's $8,000 a month just in water for this place? See, we don't want to be bound to, well, we can't repair the well. I guess we're just going to spend all this money, and here we are, you know, hemorrhaging money out of the side of us because we can't do what we need to do. And so we need to be free from financial institutions. We need to have money freed up. We need to be able to be in a position of strength and health so that we can do what we need to do as a church. Thirdly, if you remember this, we said we need freedom for more ministry. 
That we should not be hindered by finances and say, oh, I wish we could do that. I wish we could do the upgrades in the youth. I, I wish we could put some, some grass over there in the children's ministry playground. But you know what? We're just going to have to live with it. But, but uh, you know, it'd be nice someday in the sweet by and by if we could get some, some money in order to do more ministry. I wish we could reach out to more people on the streets. I wish we could build a new food distribution center to better service the needs of the people. I wish we could expand our school. And I wish we could, uh, you know, reach out in missions. I wish we could develop uh, our La Roca church service to reach the Spanish-speaking people, one of the fastest and largest growing people groups in Southern California and in the United States today. See, our heart is about people. Our heart is for the nations. Our heart is for the world. How much could we do if we had that mortgage amount and then, as well over and above that, generous giving week after week from a church that loves the Lord and that is prosperous and blessed? How much more could we do as a family together if we all got a hold of this? But you remember the most important one of all. See, all of that stuff is wonderful. All of that stuff is great. But most important, we found out that there was a fourth freedom, and that was freedom for our hearts. That God is most interested in us having hearts that are free to serve him, free to love him, free to live for him, free to give, free to be generous and kind, free to move and do what God has called us to do. And therefore, if we're bound by money, and we're not bound by the Spirit of God and by faith and by love and good works, then we're going to be in the wrong place. Because Jesus said you cannot serve both God and money. You can't serve two masters. Either you're going to love the one and hate the other, or you'll serve the one and despise the other. And so we had to get our hearts freed up from mammon because it's easy to be controlled. Well, I can't because I'll lack or because I won't have. And the money controls us instead of allowing God and His Spirit and His Word to control and to guide and guard our lives. And that's where I want to start today with the blessed life. This is part number one, like I said, talking about being givers. I'm going to make a statement. I'll put it up on the overheads for you. And I want you to either write this down if you're taking notes or make a note of it in your heart. And that is this, that giving is all about the heart. We're going to start anywhere with talking about finances, talking about a blessed life, talking about giving. Here's where we have to start. Giving is all about the heart. Now, you got Matthew chapter 7 there. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, take a look at it with me. It says this, judge not that you be not judged. Verse number 2, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, everybody say measure. measure. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. In other words, if you're giving out judgment, you're going to receive judgment. We see this all throughout the Bible as the principle of sowing and reaping. Is that right? You can see that all throughout the Bible, that if you sow an apple seed, you're going to get apples back. That if you sow discord, you're going to get discord back. That it, here it says, if you sow judgment, you will receive judgment back. And when you give that judgment out, it will be measured in the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now you got Luke chapter 6, right? Okay, you got your ribbon, your hand, your foot, something there, right? Luke chapter 6. Verse number 37 starts out the same way that Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 starts, but then it starts to part. I want to take a look at it with you. Matthew, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 6 verse number 37. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. We just read that. Is that right? Now, here's where it parts. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Here we see the same principle. Is that right? That if you pass out judgment, you're going to receive judgment. If you hand out condemnation, you are going to be handed condemnation. But if you forgive, you'll be forgiven. Now, verse number 38 is a verse that we use, that many preachers have used. You've heard it used. In fact, I've even used it from this pulpit when we've received tithes and offerings. Take a look at it. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, everybody say measure. measure. Remember, we just said that in Matthew. Now, here we are in Luke saying the same thing. What is God saying to us? He's saying, whatever you give, it is going to come back to you. So, we have to understand the principle of giving and receiving, of sowing and of reaping. Therefore, if we're going to hand out judgment, we're going to receive judgment. But if we're going to hand out forgiveness, we will receive forgiveness. And not only that, you're going to be giving it back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. In other words, whatever you sow, you're going to receive back in greater measure. We have to understand that. Now, this is using farming terms, and, and the Israelites would have understood this. Because good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, we can understand that in the natural, but I want you to remember that, that God had specific ways that he dealt with Israel. 
One of the things that he commanded the children of Israel is when they were, gleaning, when they were harvesting their fields, they would leave the edges of the fields unharvested so that the poor of the land could come and they could glean off the edges of the fields. Now, for the harvesters, this wasn't a really big deal, right? They were either hired servants or they were the sons of the master, right? And they would go out and they would have baskets and carts and all that kind of stuff, bundles. And, and they would go throughout the field and they would glean and they would just put it in their basket. And then when they were full, they would set it down. They would go get another basket and they would continue on, right? The job was supposed to be quick. They were supposed to be efficient. They were supposed to get the job done. But for the poor person in the land, it was quite different. See, as they came, they were going to have to take whatever they could from the edges of the field. They were going to have to get there during harvest time because that was the time that, that this happened. So they had to make sure that they were up early. They had to make sure that they were out. They had to make sure that they were following the harvesters, right? And here they were gleaning the edges of the field. Now, they wouldn't have brought just a little cup. Right? What would they have done? They would have got a good measure. Are you listening? So they would have came with the largest measure that they could use, maybe a basket or something like that. And as they filled up that basket, what would they do? Remember, they're poor. They don't have their own field, so they would press it down, make sure that they had enough, right, so that they could get enough room. Now, as they were pressing it down, they noticed, man, this thing is filling up real fast, so what did they do? Shake it together, right? Tamp it down, right? Press down, shake it together, and there's no air in there, okay? And then what would they do? Eventually, they would come to the point where they, they had all the air out. They had nothing. You can't really pack anything else, so they would pile it up to the top where some of it would probably be running over. See, that's the image that God gives us in his word of what happens when we give. Whatever we give, whatever we hand out, whatever we dole out, now will be handed back to us, but not just handed back to us in the same measure, but it's the same measure that you use, but good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will it be poured back into your bosom. Now, some of you are happy about that because you've been handing out love and forgiveness and kindness and grace and goodness and finance. Some of you guys are saying, oh, my goodness, judgment and condemnation and every evil thing's coming my way in better measure. Wow. But that's okay. We're here today to develop the heart. We need to understand this. See, any farmer who plants a seed isn't interested in getting one seed back. Is that right? What are they doing? They're planting a seed. Why? Because they know that as they plant that seed, they're going to receive not just one seed back. They're going to receive one plant back. And out of that plant will come multiple fruits, and out of those fruits will come multiple seeds. Think about an apple seed, right? You plant an apple seed in the ground, you get one apple back? What do you get back? You get a tree back. Is that right? On that tree will be multiple apples that have multiple seeds on the inside of them. So you can count the number of seeds in an apple, but you can't count the number of apples in a seed. So when we give, we need to understand it's coming back to us in greater measure. You don't have to worry when you give. What you have to do is take a look after your own heart. Now, good or bad, whatever we give out will be returned to us. And so when we take a look at this, especially in the area of finances, we have to understand that this is not our motivation for giving. Rather, this is a benefit or a reward of giving. Can you say amen? Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 15, if you will. Turn there with me. And while you do that, I'm going to go grab a tissue because my nose is running. Thank you. You probably don't know how embarrassing it is to wipe your nose in front of thousands of people. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Here, mute me, miss. Everybody okay? If you need to, you can right now too, okay? You there in Deuteronomy chapter 15? Let me get there. Deuteronomy's right before Joshua judges Ruth. I don't know why he judged her. You won't forget it now, will you? Verse number seven, once again, we're talking about the poor. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse seven. If there's among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates of your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut up your hand from your poor brother. Notice what he said, you shall not harden your what? Oh, come on, not just the front row. I'm talking to everybody in this place. You shall not harden your what? Your heart. See, giving is a matter of the heart. So he says, when your poor brother, when you see the poor of the land in the gates of the land which the Lord your God is giving you, I want you to notice something, that the land was given to them by 
God. Everything you have, everything that you ever will have, all that you are, all that you ever will be, has been given to you by God. Therefore, when God says, I want you to be generous, he has the right to say because he gave it all to you anyways. And he says, don't harden your heart because I gave you this land. Now you ought to give to your poor brother who's among you in your gates. Do not shut your hand from your poor brother. Verse number eight. But you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. See, God is dealing with our hearts and getting us to a place where we can get into the blessed life. But he has to start with our hearts. And so if we're going to give from a pure heart, a couple of things that we need to take a look at today. To become a giver with a pure heart, some things that we have to do. Number one is this, is that we have to deal with a selfish heart. We have to deal with a selfish heart. Deuteronomy chapter 15, look at verse number 9 now. Verse number 9 says this, beware, lest there be a wicked thought in your what? Oh, did I lose you guys already? Beware, lest there be a wicked thought in your what? In your heart. Saying the seventh year, the year of release is at hand. Now, again, we don't understand what this means. In the nation of Israel, God had given them a command that every seven years they were to release all the debts. They were to cancel all the debts. How many of you wish the United States of America had that rule and that law? I think we all could say a hearty amen to that one. We'd all be prosperous and blessed. Why? Hey, debt's gone. Debt's paid. It's gone. In addition, they had the year of Jubilee. They would release all the debts. They would, uh, they would set all the captives free, all the slaves, that sort of thing. And so this was a, a neat time for them in Israel. But he says, let's say that it's maybe the sixth year. And here you are, and your brother comes to you and he says, hey, man, can you lend me a thousand bucks? I'm just coming up short. I really have a need. I got to go, and I got to pay for this stuff. And, and you know what? I, I have the means to pay you back. I'll be sure and pay you back. And, and, and you know what? I got it. And, and, and uh, you know, it really blessed me. And here you are, and you go, oh, well, you know what? Let me check out the finance. You go to your bank account. Yeah, I got the thousand. So you're about ready to call him back, and you realize, whoa, 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 whoa. Seventh year's coming up. I don't know if I'm going to get my thousand back. See, what does God say? God says that that is a wicked thought in your heart. In other words, selfishness is sin to God because it's wicked and it's evil and it starts in the heart. We have to deal with a selfish heart. See, God is a giver. Can you say amen to that? For God so loved the world that he did what? Gave his one and only begotten son. But Satan is selfish. What did he do? I will. I will ascend. I will make myself like the most. I, I, it was all about him. He was selfish. So, so let me give you something that will help you to remember this. God and givers start with the letter G. Satan and selfish start with the letter S. Now, who do you want to be like? Do you want to be like God or do you want to be like Satan? That was a really weak answer, you guys. Come on. Um, let me think about it for a second, Pastor. Who do you want to be like? you want to be like God or you want to be like Satan? That's what I thought. We all want to be like God. We want to be like our Father, right? God is a giver. And yet, from the womb, we come out. First thing my kids said when they came out of the womb was this. Dad, I love you. Thank you for giving me life. You're so awesome. Can I do anything for you? You know, I know it's been a long night. Mom, I'm, I just put mom to bed. Can I get you a newspaper or something? A cup of coffee? No, what did they say? They said, wah, wah, wah. Now, I've got three children, so let me interpret baby talk to you. That means feed me, that means change my poopy diapers, and that means hold me, and you better not sit down when you hold me. You've got to stand the whole night. <laughs> right? No one had to be trained to be selfish. Yeah, play date with the kids. Here's little Johnny coming over, right, to play with the kids. Johnny comes in. Oh, look at little Johnny. Okay, look. Oh, my son's playing with a truck. You want to play with a car? He goes, yeah. He picks up a car, and what does your son do? Mine. <laughs> Wait, but you were playing with the truck. can he play with the car? No, I was, I was looking at the car. I was going to play with it next. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well, little Johnny, how about we pick a different toy then, you know? Let's, let's play with the leg. Oh, no, those are mine too. I was going to build a garage for the car and the truck, and in fact, while we're talking about this, everything in the room is mine. See, you don't have to, in, in fact, men, can, can I pick on our kind for a second? We still have problems sharing, don't we? Just go to a drive through with a man, and you will realize he does not want to share, right? Here he rolls up, and he rolls down the window at the, at the, the little voice box thing, right? And, and here you are. Welcome to Circus Burger. How may I help you? 
Oh, yeah, I like a large, big gut burger with a combo, fries with the chili sauce on it, and uh, extra large drink, whatever she wants. <laughs> now, the woman, you know what she does. Oh, I'm not that hungry. I'll just have some of yours. Now, you know the man sitting there thinking something, right? He's thinking, oh, no, you won't. <laughs> you want some fries? I'll order you some fries, but you better get your own. Because I ordered as much food as I'm going to eat. Is that right, gentlemen? Okay, see, we still have problems sharing, don't we? Still have problems sharing. But see, we need to deal with that selfish heart. We've got to develop a heart that's generous like our God's is. Second thing is this. Second thing is this. If we're going to become a giver with a pure heart, number two is that we have to deal with a grieving heart. Not only a selfish heart, but we have to deal with a grieving heart. Look at the next verse. Verse number 10, Deuteronomy chapter 15. You shall surely give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him. Because for this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all to which you put your hand. Now, once again, this is not a motive for giving, but this is a reward and a benefit of giving. See, when you give with the right heart, notice he says once again, your heart should not be grieved. It's a matter of the heart. And we have to deal with a grieving heart. See, selfishness attacks us before we give. Grief attacks us after we give. You ever heard of buyer's remorse? Here you are on Black Friday. You go out, find yourself in front of the televisions, right? Oh, my goodness. Look at the deals they got on TVs today, honey. We got the money to do it. This deal doesn't come around but once a year, and we, we need a new television. Ours is only 70 inches, you know. <laughs> That's small. And look at it, it's the HHDD, ours is just HD, you know, this is the new technology, and it's got the smart chip in it, and it reads your thoughts. <laughs> we got to get it. It's only $10,000. This used to be $25,000. We have it, we can do it. What do you do? You buy that thing, right? You take it home, you set it up, you watch a movie on it. My goodness, kids are dancing around you in circles, singing your praises. You go to bed that night, and you sleep sweet, but in the morning, something happens. You wake up in a cold sweat, heart pounding. <laughs> what have I done? I ruined our family. I spent our kids' college fund on a television. Oh, and thank God we kept the box, honey. I'm taking that piece of junk home. Doesn't even look high def. It didn't read my mind. And, and, and you know what? Let's take it back to the store. See, that's buyer's remorse. You feel bad about it after you bought. Same thing happens with giving, though. Did you know that? Giver's remorse. How much did you pledge to the church campaign? Do you realize what you've done? You've ruined us. Wait, you just gave that away? You know how many vacations we could have gone on for that? Oh my goodness, you, you understand how much we could have bought? What are we going to do? And yet God says the benefit, don't worry about it. The Lord your God will bless you in all your works and all which you put your hand. You don't have to worry about that. Now, to illustrate this, I need $80. Anybody have 80 bucks cash? It's Pastor Joe's birthday? Does he, Pastor Joe, you got 80 bucks? No? You got it? Pastor Joel. Yeah, hold on, let me count it. 20, 40, 60, 80. Thank you. I'm going to keep this, okay? Is that all right? All right. Thank you. So Deuteronomy chapter 15. <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? You want to talk about this? Okay, Pastor Joel, are you happy about giving that to me? Why do you think he's happy? Do you have more money in your pocket? No, he doesn't have more money in his pocket. So why are you happy about giving me all your money? Wait, wait, anybody know why? He'll get blessed back. You think I'm going to give it back to him? No, this is mine. I'm keeping it. Maybe you guys don't understand the point of the illustration. I'm not giving this back to Pastor Joel. Do you know why he's happy to give this to me? Because I gave it to him and said, there's going to come a point in the church service where I'm going to ask for $80. I want you to give this to me. 
that's why he can give it to me and be happy about it is because it was never his in the first place. He was just holding on to what was mine and he's just giving me back that which I'm asking him for and I told him to be happy about it. That's why he's happy. And I'm gonna give it back to you for the third service, okay? I want you to be happy about it when you give it back to me, okay? All right, but then after that, you don't get it back. It's mine, okay? Now, let's talk about this. You know everything you had, God gave you? It was never yours. You're not the owner. God is the owner. He is the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And therefore, when God says, I want you to go to church and they're going to ask you for money and I want you to be happy about it, you can be. You know why? Because God gave it to you. It was never yours. You're just a steward handling that which is not yours. It's another man's. It's God's. And now you're giving it back to him and you can be happy about it. And guess what? God's going to take care of your needs. Don't worry about it. God's got you covered. You can smile. You can put a big smile on your face when it comes time to give and be generous. Why? Because it's all God's anyways. We're just handling his stuff for him. Are you listening today? And God, good. Become a generous giver with a pure heart. First, we deal with stuff, but now we develop stuff. Number three, develop a generous heart. Deuteronomy chapter 15, if you keep reading, you'll find out they start talking about the slave. As they start talking about the slave, he says, when the slave leaves you on that seventh year or that year of jubilee, I don't want you to let him leave from you empty-handed like so long, sucker. Thanks for the work. Get out of here now. You bother me. No, that's not the attitude that God says. God says, I want you to leave him blessed. When he leaves your house, I want you to just pour out a blessing on him. Now look at what it says in verse number 14. It says, you shall supply him liberally. Everybody say liberally. Now, we are not talking about the conservatives and the liberals, the Democrats. It's not a political message, okay? Liberally means openly, widely, plainly, uh, you know, generously, if you will. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, and from your wine press, from what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. Now, notice he doesn't just say the flock. He doesn't just say the field. He doesn't just say the wine press. He says from all areas of your life. In other words, hey, buddy, I I'm going to bless you with some money. I'm going to bless you with some clothes. I'm going to bless you with some food. I'm going to bless you with a place to stay. I'm going to bless. Listen, God has given me an abundance. Therefore, I'm going to pour out that abundance on you. You're not leaving this place stingy and, and, and weak and frail. No, you're going to leave this place. And when people say, wow, you're blessed, you say, you should have seen my master's house. See, that's the blessing God wants us to pour out on other people. Why? Because God has so blessed us. We've got to develop a generous heart. You still got your foot there in Luke 6 or your ribbon or whatever? Turn there with me for a second. Luke chapter 6. And I want to back up. We were in verse 37 and verse 38. But I want to back up to verse number 30. Take a look at what it says. Luke chapter 6, verse number 30. It says, give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. It just got mighty quiet in this church. You can drop a pin out there in the foyer. Ding, 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 ding. It's quite contrary to what we've been taught, right? Oh, don't give to them. They're just going to use it on booze. Fool me once. Shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. I'm not giving to you. You've misused me in the past. But Jesus comes along and look at what he says. Give to everyone who asks of you. Wow. That's quite contrary to our thoughts. And then he goes, and from him who takes away your goods. In other words, they didn't ask. See, you say you take from me, you didn't ask. I'm sending your butt to jail, sucker. Right? But no, he says, don't ask him back. In other words, your neighbor comes over and borrows your saw, let him have it. God will get you a new saw. Why not? Look at what he goes on to say, verse number 31. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Now, remember, this principle applies to more than just money. So I could say in this place today, if you want people to just hand you money, you just need to hand other people money. But that, that's, that's okay, and that probably would work for you. But here's the thought, Okay. Some of you guys want to be forgiven. Time to start forgiving others. 
Some of you guys want to be loved. You have a desire to be loved. It's time for you to start loving others. Some of you guys want generosity to come to your life. It's time for you to open your hand and to start being generous with others. Why? Because just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. That's the golden rule, if you will, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Look at the next verse, verse 32. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Verse 33, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Verse 34, and if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. Verse 35, but love your enemies. Oh, wait, no, I'm supposed to hate my enemies, aren't I? No, Jesus says love. Do good and lend, hoping for 5% interest. Nah, hoping for nothing in return. Look at what he says, and your reward will be great. Now remember, that's not our motivation. That's the reward. That's the benefit. The motivation is a heart. The reward is the blessing. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. See, we think of the unthankful and the evil, and we think, gosh, thank God that's not me, right? I want you to remember that this last week, the rain came down on Southern California, and it fell on all of our houses and on some of our heads. But it also came down on the drug dealers, on the pimps and the prostitutes. It also came down on the people that cheat on their taxes and that are out for themselves. It also came down on the people that are committing adultery, people that are doing shameful things. It came down on the people who are pornographers. It came down on the people who are cheaters and users and abusers. See, God is kind to the unthankful and the evil, but that's not just other people out there in the world. That's you. And before you start judging me and judgment starts coming back to you, that's me. Why can I say that? Because before Christ, we were all unkind. We were all unthankful. We were all evil, contrary to the ways of God. And yet he still blessed us. <laughs> Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, what does it say? It says that while we were yet sinners, unthankful and evil, Christ died for us. He was kind to us. So why would we shut up our hands from someone else? Look at the last verse here that we're going to read, verse 36. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Everybody say, just as your Father. Just as your Father. Just as your father. Just as your father. Come on, everybody say, just as, your father. just as your Father. See, if you are born again, then you have a new Father, a new family. You have a new nature. And now your nature is no longer selfish like Satan, who was your Father. Your nature is now a giver like God. You were born selfish. You were born a getter, but now you are born again a giver. Are you listening today? See, we've got to develop this heart on the inside of us. I remember when we went to Bible college, my wife and I, and we had heard great stories about missionaries and different people there at the Bible college, and we heard about somebody who's given away their cars. They just got so blessed giving away cars, and eventually they gave away 10 cars, and then they were giving away houses and land and all sorts of other stuff. We, we got excited about giving. And we said, wouldn't it be cool if someday we could give away a car? That, that to us was a big deal. We were like, whoa, that would be so neat to give away a car. My goodness. Now, when we went out there, we had two cars. We had my car, which was a new car, and my wife's car, which was an older car. And her car, some stuff had happened to it, didn't have the, the airbag in the steering wheel, and it didn't have uh, air conditioning. Now, in Oklahoma, that is a curse. That is not a blessing, okay? If you're going to drive in Oklahoma without AC, God be with you. But while we were there, we ended up getting a job at the same place, and so all of our schedules were the same. We had the same work schedule, the same school schedule. We did everything together. So, you know, we're newlyweds. We got married, and three weeks later, here we were at Bible college. So it worked out for us. One car, we always wanted to be together, and so we got the desire of our heart. Now, while we were there, we worked at one of those big box stores, right? Uh, those warehouse stores. And so we had met a couple that was there, a blended family, uh, husband and wife, and they, between the two of them had seven children and one minivan for the whole family. Now, do the math. Most minivans don't have nine seats. So I don't know what they did or how they did it, but somehow they got everybody where they needed to go with seven seats in that minivan. I guess two of the kids just ran behind the back of the van everywhere they went or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> so my wife, in talking to them, found out that they're godly people, Christian couple, you know, very neat people. And so she offered to them, anytime you want to borrow our extra car, you're welcome to. Oh, what a blessing. Thank you. So from time to time, hey, could, could we borrow the car? We got something going on this weekend. They got games over here. I got this over there. Yes, here you go. Be blessed, right? And so they would borrow the car. Now, when we came home for the summer, we said, 
Vaya con Dios, brothers and sisters, but you can borrow this car over the summer, but just realize it doesn't have AC. And they said, no, it doesn't matter to us. It's a blessing to us. So they borrowed the car for the whole summer. Came back from, from summer break, got back into school, and they gave us the car back. And every now and then, hey, by the way, can we borrow the car? Absolutely, here you go. Now, when we were coming home, we started making plans, and I said, okay, I'm going to drive the truck with all the stuff in the back, and, and you drive the car, and then wait, wait, wait. What are we going to do with the other car? Aha, these are of our heart. We wanted to give away a car. Why not bless this family with a car? They would just be floored. That would be awesome. So my wife had the keys, and she was so excited. She knew exactly how she was going to do it. We got the couple together there in the front of the store, and she said, we want you to be blessed. This is now yours. The woman opened up her hands. She saw the keys, and I remember both her and her husband looked like they got punched in the gut. They were just like, you know, like this. And I remember her big old eyes, and she just said out loud, and the whole store heard her, praise God. You know, I was like, whoa. Felt the power go out right there. But we got so excited that the moment we left that store that day, I remember looking at the new car, and I said, man, I'm going to give this car away next. This one's coming. See, now all of a sudden it was contagious. It was infectious. We were excited to give. Ten years, almost to the day that I bought that car, I was able to give that car to someone else. See, you, when you develop a generous heart, now all of a sudden it gets on the inside of you and you become more and more like God. I got to run. Number four. Number four. Last one for today is this. Okay? Last one for today is this, is develop a grateful heart. We have to develop a grateful heart. You remember where Deuteronomy chapter 15 is? Turn back there real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 15 Verse number 15, last verse for today is this. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse number 15 says this. It says, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing today. Notice it's a command. God isn't giving us an option. God is saying you have to be generous. Why? Because just as the slave is going out from you, I want you to remember that you were a slave. Now, is God doing that to bring condemnation and guilt on them? Is God guilting them into giving? Do you think that's what the heart of God is in this matter? God ever remind us of our past and say, you little whelp, you used to be bound, you used to be on drugs, you should be dead right now, so you better do what I ask you. Is that how God treats us? No, God is a loving father. What is he doing? He's reminding them you were once in the same position they were in so that we can say, oh yeah, I remember those days. God, God, I'm so grateful that I'm not there anymore. I'm so grateful that you planted my feet on the rock. Grateful that you raised me up out of the muck and the mire. Grateful, God, that I'm not six feet under, but that I'm above and not beneath, that I'm the head and not the tail. God, I am so thankful, God, that you saved me, that you raised me, God, that you blessed me, Lord. And now because I'm blessed, God, I'm going to bless others. I'm going to be generous. See, that's the heartbeat of God, developing a grateful heart. It's all about the heart. See, when you start with the heart, that's your motivation. I want to give because taking on the nature of God, it's not the benefit of the return. No, that's a reward and that's a benefit, that's a blessing, but it's all about the heart. There's a student that went to a Bible school in Costa Rica, worked at a peanut farm to pay his bills there at the Bible school, and they had something every Friday called Bless Another Day. He was thinking about what he could do, and so he went to his boss there at the peanut farm, and he said, I want you to take the amount out of my wages for one peanut a week. Now, think about how easy it would have been for him to just pocket a couple peanuts every week. He could have done that, but listen, the Lord rewards integrity. And so here he went to his boss. He got one peanut a week taken out of his salary, and that one peanut a week he would take every Friday and bless another student with it. Well, don't you know, after long, he was not just giving out one peanut, he was giving out multiple peanuts, and then he was giving out money, and then eventually school supplies. Then after a while, he was starting to bless others' tuition. By the time he graduated from that Bible school, he was paying for his own bills as well supporting 10 other students with their tuition. Now, if that wasn't enough, within a couple years of him graduating from that Bible school, he went back and bought the peanut farm and was supporting scores of other students to go through the same Bible school. See, it all started with a heart to give. It started somewhere, and out of that heart, there was a blessing that came back. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over was it poured back into his bosom. With the same measure he used, it was measured back to him. Let's just take a moment. I want you to bow in the presence of the Lord. Close your eyes. And I want you to just listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now? Just take some time with God. Set your heart on the Lord. What is God speaking to you? Just take a moment. If you want to write that down on a sheet of paper, what God's speaking to you, maybe you want to type it out on your phone, on a little note or on your tablet. Whatever it is that the Holy Spirit's speaking to your heart right now, 
Just commit that to the Lord. Maybe God's asking you to forgive. Maybe God's asking you to be loving. Maybe God's reminding you of a previous commitment you made. He's asking you to step out in faith and believe him. Do it. Let's commit that to the Lord right now. Lord, we say yes. God, thank you for developing our hearts to be generous givers, God, with a grateful heart. Lord, we don't want to be selfish and stingy. We don't want to be grieving givers, God. We want to be like our Father in heaven. So, Lord, we love you and we give you praise this day in Jesus' name. Everybody in agreement said amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise today. Hallelujah. God is good. I want to talk to you guys before you leave this place. It would be a tragedy if we came into the house of God, sang songs, cried. Some of us blew our nose in front of everybody, laughed, and had such a good time in the Word. And I believe you got something from the Word of the Lord today. But it would be a tragedy if we did all that, and then you left this place, and your heart wasn't right with God, and you died and you went to hell and didn't end up in heaven. Now, sometimes people say, well, Pastor, I'm not going to go to hell because hell's not real. That's a made-up fairy tale story. And yet, did you know the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament? It's a very real place. Jesus himself spoke of it. You're not going to get out of it by denying its existence. You're going to have to face the reality of hell. And I don't want you to go there. You don't want you to go there. But most of all, do you know this? God doesn't want you to go there. That's why Jesus suffered and died on the cross. So that we could choose while we're here on this earth with our lives, where we're going to end up, whether heaven or hell. Now, sometimes people say, well, that choice has been made. All roads lead to heaven now. And I can just do whatever I want to do, and I'll get there. You do whatever you want to do. I appreciate you. As long as we stay true to ourselves, you know, and just seek God somehow, some way, we'll make it. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that all roads lead to heaven? That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Drive around the earth as long as you want. You will never make it to the moon. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You know what that means? It's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Do whatever you want to do and you'll make it somehow, some way. No, there's one way. The Bible tells us that the road is narrow, hard to find. And yet, God is not hiding it from us, even though it's hard to find. God reveals it to us in his word. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I know a lot of people turn off when they hear that term, born again. What, what is that all about? I saw that in a movie or read about it on the internet on a blog or saw it in, in some books or some television shows, and it was weird. It was crazy. It was something that I don't want to be a part of. Well, of course you don't want to because they don't have the right definition of what being born again is, and of course they're going to make it out to be something weird. Let's not let the world or society, Hollywood movies, television, books, or the internet define for us what being born again is. Let's... Let the Bible define that for us. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. And yet a lot of times people kick against that because they say, no, pastor, you've just got to be a good person to get to heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible say how good you have to be to get into heaven? There's no grading scale, no line that you have to be above. No, do this much good or have your good outweigh your bad. It doesn't work like that. You can't be good enough to get into heaven because the standard based on your works is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. You're not going to make it to heaven by being good. You must be born again, giving him all of your heart and all of your life. You can't serve enough. You can't volunteer enough. You can't give enough money. You can't be nice enough or kind enough or smart enough. You can't know enough about God. See, if it was just about what we knew, then the devil and the demons would be able to go to heaven. They know who Jesus is. They're not Christians. The devil can quote scriptures out of his mouth and knows who Jesus is, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So this is not about what you have up here in your head. Look up here, look up here. This is not about what's up here in your head. This is about what you've done with your heart. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? If not, I love you so much. I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not gonna make it. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross and graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he talking about? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus... Not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. 
But today I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now you might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be embarrassed. Let's get over that today. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. No one's that dumb. Come on. And yet the devil thinks you're dumb. That's why he's trying to talk you out of this right now. Flesh is trying to hold you back. Listen, push past all that today. You're in a safe and friendly church. All of us have done this at one point or another. Now it's your turn. We're excited for you. No one's judging, criticizing, or condemning. We love you enough. Take some time out today and give you this wonderful opportunity to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. Now, who should raise your hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today is your day. Come on, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this? Never said yes to Jesus, given him all of your heart and all of your life. Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up in the safe, friendly church service. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television, in the foyer, uh, through the breezeways, in the sound of my voice, down at the Love Rock Cafe. Come on, put the burger down. Get ready to get your hand up. This is your time. This is your moment. Online. If you're live streaming, watching wherever you're at, this is your time, your moment of salvation. God sees, God's watching, and then you can minimize that screen and click respond to God or go to our homepage, rockchurch.com, and click how to know God, and someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up. Here we go, all together on the count of three if you need to do this. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's where you at. Come on, raise them up high for me. Two wise people already. There's three. There's four. God bless you guys. There's five up top. Got you over there. Five wise people already. Who else today? Saying, you, you know, I need to give God all my heart. need to give God all my life. I know there's a whole lot more than five in this place. Just get your hand up when I'm looking in your direction. Who else today? There's five wise people already. Six. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? Saying, yeah, I need to do this. I need to go for God today. All my heart. All my life. I've been half-hearted. I've been holding back. I've never done it. Come on. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Thank you up top. Got you up there. Thank you. God bless you. About five or six wise people. Seven. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? Say, I need to give God all my heart. I need to give God all my life. Just want to take another moment. Just take this moment and search your heart. Say, God, where am I at? And listen, if you're not sure, today make sure. Just pop it up. I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else real quick? God's tugging at your heart right now. Will you respond to that call? Anybody else real quick? It's raised up high for me when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Thank you. Got you up there. God bless you. Who else today? Anybody else in this section? Over here on this side. Anybody else real quick? Saying, yeah, I need to do it. That's you. Got about eight or nine wise people already. Come on, just raise your hand up. Anybody else? This is the last call, and then I'm going to close this up. Okay, the preacher preached way too long today, so I need to get you guys going. Who else today? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. Now listen, there are about eight or nine of you. There's 15, not total, more. The Lord just spoke to my heart. Listen, if God can speak to my heart about what to preach, God can speak to me about your life, where you're at. So there's 15 more of you that needed to raise your hand, but you didn't. You, you were holding back today. Listen, God loves you so much. This church is a loving place. Here's your opportunity. You haven't missed out yet. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. As we do that, that's your cue. If you raised your hand, those eight or nine of you that did, or if you should have raised your hand but you didn't, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend, and you get in the aisle and meet me up front. Come on right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on, let's welcome them as they come. Jesus, I believe. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. In you. you can come too. This is your time. Jesus, I this is your moment of salvation. To you. You're the reason that I live. They're coming. They're coming. The From the family rooms. You want to bring your children? They're welcome at this time. Bring them on down. Come on down. From the foyer, if you heard that and you were saying, I need to do that, come back into the church service right now. Come on down. 
They're still coming. You're the reason that I live. Come on down. The reason Anybody else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front. Come on down. All right. Hey, there's a whole lot more than eight or nine people up here. That means that you guys responded. Praise God. I'm so happy for you guys. Right over here to my right, your left. The guy that gave me the 80 bucks, he is tapped out. There's no more money in his pocket. But he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Most important decision of your life right here. Worth much more than money or anything like that. This is, this is the most awesome time of your life, okay? So he's gonna lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're gonna get the greatest gift ever, the gift of salvation, gift of Jesus living on the inside of you. That's the Holy Spirit coming on the inside of you. You're gonna be brand new from the inside out, okay? Taking on a new nature like we talked about. He's gonna give you some free information, some free materials that'll help you to understand what just happened and how to live this new life, okay? And then he's gonna talk to you about a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Basically, it's a friend in church. We all need friends to encourage us, okay? SPT or Spiritual Personal Trainers, a friend in church who help you get strong in the ways of the Lord. It's easy, it's free, you guys need to do it, okay? Then he'll let you come right back out in church service. Okay, your friends and family will wait for you. If you guys make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.